Hello everyone, I'm here with Jay Smith of Speaker's Corner, uh, so he's across the ocean uh, from me, and Jay, uh, before we uh, get into our topic, uh, what do you do at Speaker's Corner? Well, every Sunday I go down there with a team of people, mainly from our workshop, they could be from all over the yeah, United Kingdom, many of them live here in London. We head on down there every afternoon, uh, Sunday afternoon, about 4 o'clock, get up on the ladder, and we take on, it could be hundreds, sometimes thousands in the summertime, Muslims who come down to engage publicly. And so when you have discussions with Muslims, do you just focus on Christianity or do you address Islam as well? No, we go there to focus on Islam. We introduce Christianity, that's the whole purpose why we're there. Uh, but because Speaker's Corner is so unique, it's one of the only places on earth where we can really confront it head on. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's unique in the world. I don't think there's any other place that's like Speaker's Corner. Uh, we engage at a much stronger level. We certainly are a lot more aggressive. Mm -hmm. We ask questions there that we can't ask anywhere else. Mm -hmm. We also use it as a laboratory. It's a place where people send us material. Um, they send us uh, research that they're doing. They want us to field test it. Mm -hmm. And because there's Muslims from all over the world, and there's hundreds at a time, you get an immediate reaction. Mm -hmm. Now, that's actually what I wanted to talk to you about because one of the things I've experienced in the West, uh, mm -hmm. Sam Shamoon and I do a show called Jesus or Muhammad. We write articles, we do blog posts, and there are lots of, even Christians, uh, who strongly resist the idea that Christians should be uh, criticizing Islam. I've been told by many Christians yeah. that what we need to do is focus on preaching the gospel and building bridges. And we shouldn't uh, criticize Islam because it's so offensive to Muslims that it's going to, to sever any kind of relationship we might have and it's going to just destroy the Muslims' ability to ever hear the gospel. Now, what? Now, have you encountered that sort of attitude here? Yeah, I think, I think especially here in, in Britain, I think it's more pervasive than what you get even in the United mm -hmm. States. I, I think it's a, um, this grace method, they call it here, mm -hmm. is the status quo of all the churches. But I think, David, what we need... The, when you even ask that question, it's offensive to Islam. Well, who do you, whose agenda do you think that is? Mm -hmm. It plays right into the Muslim's hand. Mm -hmm. And I think for many Christians, we need to stop and ask ourselves, if you look back into the book of Acts, if you go back, especially from Acts chapter 17 to 19, mm -hmm. look and see how Paul acted in Cappadocia, Laodicea, Berea, there in Ephesus. Mm -hmm. Just take a look and see how he acted, and then look and see what he did whenever he went to these cities. He went right into the synagogues. He confronted the Jews, what they had done to the Messiah. That's polemics. Mm -hmm. That's confrontation. Look at the reaction. If you have any doubt, look at the reaction, how the Jews treated him. They disregarded him. Sometimes they threw him out. Many times he was thrown into prison. He was whipped twice. He was almost stoned to death, and finally they killed him in Rome. Mm -hmm. Now, that kind of reaction doesn't just come from dialoguing or trying to find commonality with the, the adversary. No, the fact that he was so confrontational and the fact that he started so many churches everywhere he went, that model is not being taught today. It's not being used. What you're doing in your debating is very much following that Pauline model. And if this is good enough for the first century, I don't see why it should be good enough for the 21st century. Well, that would be the objection that we kind of have. A, a, we're in a different age now, right? We're in a different age. And, and uh, I mean, just try to think about it. I'm just playing devil's advocate now. But try uh, to think about it from the perspective of... Uh, someone who has, a Christian who has a ministry, right? They have a ministry reaching out to Muslims and they're trying to show, hey, that, that the Christians are, are very loving people because mm -hmm. lots, of, lots of Christians um, do want to compare Christianity with Islam and Muslims have, have seen a lot of the, the violence, the terrorism that comes from their religion. And so lots of Christians want to say, look, you see how, how gentle and loving we are. Uh, wouldn't you prefer this? And then someone like you comes along and starts and blasting and blasting, yeah, me, <laughs> blasting and blasting and blasting, and Muhammad's this and Muhammad's that, and look at all the horrible things yeah. Muhammad has done. And uh, some Christians will even say, "Hey, you're 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 hurting the work that we're trying to do, yeah. building and I, these bridges." And I think that's a valid criticism. Many Christians feel not only threatened by what we're doing, they might say it even goes against, it's counterproductive to what they're doing. And I think what we need to we need to stress, and to people who are listening, um, hear what we're saying. There are many different gifts, there are many different parts of the body of the church, and there are many different things that we're called to do. I would not ask many of the people who are watching us to do what we're doing. It's, it, it is a gift that is unique. It's going on the offensive. Mm -hmm. uh, let me just give you an example. You have American football in America, and you have two different teams, mm -hmm. defense and offense. Yeah. And we're all called to defend the faith. I don't think anybody can, would, uh, can look at Scripture and come away with any other um, 
any other conclusion mm-hmm. that we are all called to be apologetical. That's, that's first, defensive. First Peter three fifteen. There you go, and that's that's defense. We're all called to be defensive, but the not everybody. In fact, you know that you don't win games just by being defensive. Mm-hmm. You need an offense as well. In yeah. fact, I would suggest that the offenses, in some in many cases, are certainly the best known players, and they're the ones that are highest paid. Mm-hmm. They have a whole other set of skills that defense does need. Mm-hmm. We don't teach offense in Christianity because people think it's offensive. Mm-hmm. They think it's not Christ-like. It's not something that we would see in the gospel. It's not something that's productive, as you've just said. Mm-hmm. And interestingly, the early church didn't have that problem. They used both defense and offense. Mm-hmm. Christ used both defense and offense. He was very defensive with Nicodemus when he came to him in the middle of the night. Uh, he was certainly very defensive with those who came and came with an open heart. But he was also very offensive. Take a look and see what he did with money changers there in the temple. Or look at Matthew 23. The entire chapter from verse 13 to 33, you hypocrite, you den of vipers, you white sepulcher, mm-hmm. over and over and over again. That's my Jesus. Mm-hmm. And that's the side of Jesus we don't like. Now, if that's offensive, then we need to ask, what was Jesus doing? Mm-hmm. Of course he was offensive. The gospel, by definition, is offensive. Mm-hmm. And I think we need to stop and ask ourselves, if we're going to be preaching the gospel, if we're going to say that God came to earth, that's going to offend the Muslim. If we're going to say that God actually uh, claimed to be God, uh, man, Jesus claimed to be God, that's offensive to Muslims. If we're going to say that God actually died on the cross, that's hugely offensive to Muslims. But I refuse to open my mouth unless I say those three things. Mm-hmm. I've got to preach the gospel, and by definition, the gospel is offensive. So if we're going to spend all our time trying to find commonality or trying to find a way to acquiesce to Islam, we're not going to preach the gospel. More than that, we're not going to be effective to them because for most Muslims I know, they love polemics. Mm-hmm. If you have any doubt, just go down, come down to Speaker's Corner and see how they work and how they um, not only communicate, but look and see their, their leaders. Go up on YouTube, and I encourage you to go up on YouTube and look at the over 43,000 videos out there that are confronting Christianity. Now, t- can you tell me that Muslims don't like those videos? Do they not produce those videos? Do they not mm-hmm. consider them to be effective? The fact that they're producing those videos that are highly offensive to us, but for them, as far as they're concerned, this is the most effective way to communicate what they believe is their own truth. Mm-hmm. Now, if they see that as not offensive, then why would they think what we're doing is offensive? Mm-hmm. And I think for many of us, we need to change and, and try to incarnate what we're talking about. I rarely find Muslims that get offended by what I'm saying. I'm sorry, let me cut. They get offended not by what I'm saying. Many times, it's my attitude. And I think we need to be careful. I find when I ask many Muslims, how would they define a Christian? You know what they tell me? They say that Christians are weak, Christians are timid, Christians cannot defend what they know. They don't know very much to begin with. Yeah. Now that's a huge indictment against us, but that's the way we come across. We come across as ineffectual, we come across as timid, uh, we come across as unknowing, and more than that, highly ineff- uh, high, uh, not able to even defend what little we know. I don't see that in the New Testament. I don't see that in the ministry of Paul. I don't see that in the ministry of Jesus Christ. And that's why I think we need to start incarnating our methodology and saying, listen, the people we're working with are very similar to the people that Christ and Paul work with. In fact, I would say that your average radical Muslim today is as, uh, is as probably as fundamental and certainly as, as uh, methodologically uh, uh, parallel to what we find amongst the people that Paul had to work with. Mm-hmm. And certainly a zealot or a radical Jew in the first century is very similar to a radical Muslim in the 21st century. Mm-hmm. They both want to start a theocratic state. They both believe that violence is perfectly acceptable to use. Saul was that way. He was a radical Jew. Just take a look at Saul and see if he's mm-hmm. not very parallel to many of our radical Muslims that we're dealing with. Mm-hmm. Because of that, I think we need to go back to that standard. We need to go back and find how is it we can re- not only reproduce what was being done in the first century, but how can we start to be a little bit more effective in our methodology. Mm-hmm. Uh, but going back to something you said earlier, I thought I think is very important. Uh, you wouldn't have any problem with a Christian who says, uh, you know, I'm just going to focus on the gospel with dealing when I'm dealing with Muslims. I'm just going to present the gospel. I'm not going to criticize Islam. You wouldn't have any problem with a Christian saying, please that, do right? that. And I would say to those watching, the vast majority you will have to do that. The vast majority are called. To, in fact, we're all called to do that. I think we all start there. I think what happens is once you start there, sooner or later, you're going to start introducing the gospel. Yeah, please do. And I'd say, please get the gospel in there. Don't just talk about the weather. Don't just talk about what's in the news. Get to Jesus Christ. Soon as you introduce Jesus Christ as God, they're going to start asking questions. What are you going to do then? Walk away? 
Set, uh, not answer the questions, not try to take the same question and throw it right back at them. You've got to, at some point, be confrontational. Mm -hmm. uh, otherwise, you're not preaching the gospel. Now, what we're doing is, is, is the next step. That's going and starting, and what I would say is actually going on the offense. Mm -hmm. uh, as a good pacifist, I like to use a Marine as my model. The Marines are the ones that go in and do the frontal assaults. They get the beachhead. I don't know if you know, but I was a Marine at one time as oh, a pacifist. Yeah. I did the 12-week training there in Quantico, and I refused my commission when I, when I finished. Because you're a pacifist? Uh, because of my pacifist yeah. ideals. Yeah, I went in there undercover just to see what, why people would go to war. If I'm going to be a pacifist, one to five, why are the other guys went to war? Now, nonetheless, I learned that the Marines are the first to go in. They're the ones that take the frontal assault, they take the beachhead, mm -hmm. and then they give it and can let the you know, army go along and consolidate. In some ways, what you and I are doing, unlike the Marines, we go in there, Sam Shimon does the same thing. We go and confront, now it takes a whole, whole other set of skills than those who come in and consolidate. And I'm saying not everybody who's watching should be doing what we're doing. Mm -hmm. That set of skills you've learned to do, I've learned to do. And when you go and confront Islam head on with the same questions that they're confronting us on, uh, with head on, you're going to get a reaction that not many Christians are comfortable with. Mm -hmm. And you're, you don't have a difficulty that with your background after hearing what I heard in the car this, uh, this evening. Yeah. We're not going to talk about that right now on camera, but your background has prepared you for this kind of reaction. Yeah, yeah. You don't seem to be at all be afraid or threatened by the reaction you got, not only today, but what you get uh, there on Sunday when you were on that ladder. Mm -hmm. It doesn't phase you. No. And that's why you've been gifted for that. Mm -hmm. And what I say to people who are watching this, let us do that side of it. Let us take that battle. Let us take the beachhead. Understand we're not asking you to do that. Don't feel threatened. You're, all you're called to do is defend the gospel. A few of us are called to go on the offense. But please stop telling us we must not do that. Because if you're going to tell us not to do that, then what are you going to do with Paul? What are you going to do with Jesus? What are you going to do with the early church? What are you going to do with every one of the disciples? Every one of them was hated. They were persecuted. They were all jailed. They were all flogged. And they were all killed, except for John. Now stop and ask me. Why would they be hated and persecuted? Why were they all thrown in jail? Why were they all flogged? And why were they all killed if they were not confronting? They were building bridges. There you go. That yeah. Building bridges doesn't cause that. Yeah. Building bridges can, yeah. can lead to that. Yeah. But sooner or later, leading to what? You've got to lead to the gospel, mm -hmm. and that will mm -hmm. confront. Yeah, and uh, I'd just like to, to, to end with kind of a, a personal story. See, there, there are, and we've heard about this, lots of, uh, of people who've uh, left Islam for Christianity uh, have said, you know, they saw the violence in Islam, they saw that, and then they compared it with, with Jesus' method, message of love, mm -hmm. and they said, wow, you know, th this, is, this, is, this, is, this has to be the truth. And so there are Muslims like that who they just need to hear the gospel. But uh, I also know people who have converted to Islam, and they would never even have considered Christianity as an option if they hadn't seen problems with Islam. And uh, I found this uh, with my friend Nabil, who became uh, a Christian after years of having this discussion. He didn't tell me until later, after he'd become a Christian, but he said that when we were having discussions about the resurrection, right, he, he would realize that, that I'm presenting a good case for Jesus' death by crucifixion and his resurrection from the dead. But he said in his mind he was thinking, even if David could convince me with 99% certainty that Jesus rose from the dead, I am still 100% certain that Muhammad is a prophet, and yep. so David's case fails. And so it wasn't until we actually challenged that case uh, for Muhammad, caused, uh, brought about doubts about Muhammad that, that Nabil was actually open to uh, considering the alternative no, possibility. Stop, and that right there, I think you're making a huge... Uh, it's something that the, the hearers need to hear. It takes uh, individuals to get, and I think for many Muslims, they are so convinced that Allah is God, they are so convinced Muhammad is a prophet, they are so convinced the Quran is the, the final word of God. How do you get that convict? How do you get that conviction and bring in some type of a, 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 a chink in their armor? Mm -hmm. How do you get them to even consider that there may be a problem with their mm -hmm. Quran, there may be a problem with their God, and there may be a problem mm -hmm. uh, with their prophet? How are you going to do that unless someone actually creates that doubt? Now, in order to create that doubt, it doesn't happen overnight. Sometimes it happens, and in the case with Nabil, it took four years. Mm -hmm. For many Muslims, they can even look back and remember. I remember I've had Muslims come up to me and say, Jay, something that you said seven years ago. I was at a debate you were at seven years ago, and it was that debate that started the doubt, that started the questions. It took them quite a few years before they came through, but they go back to that debate that they saw. And that's why I think, in some ways, we, we, we must be careful that we don't look for the quick, the quick uh, uh, response. The quick responses don't usually come. The doubts begin. Once the doubts begin, 
And once they start to realize that much of what they've thought their whole life to be true is not true. Mm -hmm. But how are they going to hear that unless someone goes to them? And how are they going to go unless they're sent? Mm -hmm. How beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news? You've Amen. got beautiful feet. All right. Well, thank you, Jay Smith. And uh, God bless you. Look forward to seeing more videos with you on uh, Speaker's Corner.